So yeah, I'm going to blow through some of the administrative stuff because we are starting about uh, three or four minutes late. And this is, as always, the first lectures are always really packed. But this is Introduction to Computing Systems, CS24, a class that seems to be universally loved, even though I keep making it harder and harder. I don't get it, but that's just the way it's been. Uh, so yeah, Introduction to Computing Systems. What we basically focus on in this course is how computers work. Why? Well, we don't get into all the whys as to why they're designed the way that they are and why operating systems are the way that the, they are, but we do cover a lot of those fundamental themes in this class. So features, capabilities, optimizations, processors provide. Uh, how do we translate programs and languages that we're familiar with into machine code that processors are able to execute? We'll go through that process in a lot of gory detail. Um, you may get sick of that, but hey, it's life. Um, Let's see, common runtime support. So we'll talk about things like memory management, malloc, garbage collection, subroutines. That's kind of low level, but we take it for granted, but it's in there. Uh, and then what do operating systems do for us? So we talk about a lot of details about the abstractions that operating systems implement. Very powerful, ubiquitous. They've been around since the 60s. None of you have been around since the 60s. I haven't been around since the 60s, but they're really important, powerful concepts, and so we continue using them to this day. So we'll go through a lot of the de details. Uh, the course website, we run everything on Moodle in this class. You should get on there, like especially if you're bored already. Uh, get on there right now and enroll. The enrollment key is segfault, a word that you'll become very familiar with by the end of the term. Oh, look, I write code that's segfault. I had a segfault last week. So uh, just, you just get used to it. Okay, yeah, so make sure that you enroll in it because that's how I do all my announcements. That's where assignments are made available. That's where lecture slides are made available and so forth. So very important to get on that as quickly as possible. I'll probably start sending emails or, or information today or tomorrow. So it's important to get on there. Okay, let me see what else. Yeah, so it's kind of an important note that uh, second to last bullet here, I will keep track of your overall grades separately. So we will give you your raw grades over Moodle, but Moodle is not capable of keeping track of everything that we do in this class. Late penalties, tokens, and so forth. So if you're ever curious about your grade, ask. And I will be happy to share that information with you. Okay. So uh, just make sure that you are aware that your Moodle grade is a raw grade. We'll try to make sure that all of that is very explicitly spelled out on the course website. Now the other thing is that we will have guidelines for every assignment, a big part of that is actually your coding style. We don't want you to uh, under comment, over comment, uh, write variable names that are 35 characters long or one character long for everything. So um, all of those kinds of details are very important in software programming just because change is a constant in software programming and engineering. You always end up going back and adding features, fixing features, removing features, and so it's important that you write your programs in a way that makes them easy to maintain. So that's why that's part of that. I won't uh, belabor that too much right now because it's not kind of critical, but if you have any beefs with me about this, tough. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, so I know. Okay, let's see. Uh, course weighting, this is basically how we weight everything. So midterm and final are each 15% of the grade. You can see that that's about, uh, well, just under twice of an assignment's value. Assignments are eight and three quarter percent of your grade. That's just how the math works out. I want you to keep that in mind because when we start talking about late penalties, I want you to realize that being a day late every once in a while isn't that big a deal. People seem to flip out about this. If you're going to be two or three days late, that's when you need to start thinking about uh, what you can do about the situation. But if you're a day late, it really isn't that big a deal. I do sometimes curve things, but it tends to be infrequent and unnecessary. Okay, so just keep that in mind. I try to design assignments and, and exams. Now, I know that it's sort of like, you know, there was, when I was an undergrad, I got like 25% uh, on an exam and it was an A. I mean, we all have stories like that. Um, that means that the exam was written badly. So I try not to do that in my classes. I know Mike does the same thing with his exams. So um, basically, if we have a need, then we will curve things, but I will let you know if we decide to and generally assume that we probably won't. But we'll, we'll set all that out as we go through the course. Late policy, so I basically have a, uh, a, an accumulating late penalty, so 10% for one day late, that's up to 24 hours late. I tend to give people, like if you check, if you submit your work like five minutes past the deadline, 
we probably won't mind because there's differences in computer clocks and so forth, and you might think you submitted it on time. Uh, if, if you're getting up to like 10, 15 minutes, you'll start making us grumpy, and if you do it a lot, we'll probably complain to you about it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, two days late, 10 plus 20 percent, so 30 percent, 10 plus 20 plus 30 is 60 percent, and then after three days, it's too late. So just keep that in mind. Um, that's the stick, but there's also carrots involved in the situation. So we, we give you late tokens because we realize that sometimes things happen. You know, you decided to stay up late watching a marathon of some TV show that you really like or whatever. I don't care. Um, and so you have these late tokens, and you can apply late tokens to assignments to give yourself up to, uh, or I should say, 24 hours of extension per token. You can't apply partial tokens. Don't even try. Um, but basically, what you can do on your assignment is say, I want to apply this many tokens. And we will say, okay, and we'll record that in our spreadsheet, and it will compute the late penalties, uh, or lack thereof, appropriately, and so forth. So that's a nice thing that you can do. So you have up to four late tokens. Seniors, are there seniors in here? There's always seniors. Um, you guys get extra late tokens because of ditch day. If I find out your ditch day stack sucked, I will probably take away your senior <laughs> late tokens. But... If you want extra late tokens so that you can make Ditch Day an awesome experience for everyone, I will be happy to grant them. So just talk to me about that. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say about this? Yes, um, also if you have like health center issues, a lot of times I, I have people come up to me and they're like sniffling or bleeding from orifices or whatever. <laughs> you know, I have Ebola, can I use a late token? <laughs> And I'm like, go to the health center. They, the health center is very generous with extensions. And so if you have a situation like that, ask for a health center note, and uh, we'll be happy to put that into the spreadsheet. Um, also, dean's office extensions. Although you should be aware that the dean's office won't grant you an extension for I'm behind and, and I need extra time. They generally will say, go talk to the professor. So, you know... That, that's really the best situation to use late tokens, but we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in whatever situations arise. But Dean's Office, again, if you have other extenuating circumstances that you don't want to talk to other people about or whatever, they'll be happy to, uh, to hear your case, and I will be happy to uh, follow whatever their advice is. Okay, so that's enough about late policies. Uh, assignments, yeah, it is a very time-consuming class, particularly for people who aren't completely familiar with some of the prerequisites, like C, or things like that. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But you should definitely always start assignments before they're due. Like, I would probably start assignments, you know, when it comes out, read it. Okay, that looks really horrible. At least now you know. And then maybe, <laughs> maybe a, couple day, you know, a couple days in, you can start trying to work through some of it and uh, start getting a sense of what's going on. It's going to make office hours a lot more productive because you'll have specific questions to ask. The TAs will prioritize people based on whether or not they're like, Can explain the assignment to me versus I have this crashing bug and I've traced it down to this section and I don't understand why it's failing. They will be much happier with specific questions than general questions. Okay? So, uh, yeah, just make sure you don't get caught out by that. There are assignments that are more involved. Assignments three and four tend to be particularly involved. Okay? So just be aware of that. You should start those like the day that I put them out. That would be a good thing to do. And you'll submit your assignments via Moodle. There will be instructions at the top of every assignment. You need to follow those zealously or else you will be penalized. And the reason why is because we have scripts. You can imagine with 130 people, we have to have scripts to do some of our processing. And if you don't follow the guidelines, our scripts break. And then we get grouchy. And you don't want somebody who's grouchy to grade your assignment because points start disappearing. So um, just be aware of this. Ask your TAs for help. Ask me for help. If you want to verify something before you submit it, that would be great. You know, it's no problem at all. Just make sure that uh, you follow the instructions. Let's see, textbook. So there is a textbook for this class. It is a suggested textbook, not a required textbook. It's an awesome textbook, too. I actually like the first edition better than the second edition, but... Um, I think it's just because I'm old and cranky that way. The second edition is still very, very good. So, um, unfortunately, you can see the price. You almost need to take out a loan just to buy this book, and I don't like that at all. So, what I do is exercise this great country's fair use laws and give you copies of the material that you need. 
Okay, so you'll notice that for the first assignment, there will be a little PDF of the portions of the book you actually care about for the first assignment and the second assignment and so forth. The other thing, sometimes we get questions. What about the international edition? International editions are awesome, but sometimes they change the problems. So make sure that if you do acquire an international edition or a PDF from some shady website, I don't care, I don't want to know about it, um, make sure that you use our provided PDFs of the problems, or else you may find you're solving the wrong problem and then you lose a bunch of points and we all get cranky about it. Okay? So just be aware of that. Any questions so far? Alrighty. That's a good sign. Programming. So yeah, I mentioned before that uh, C and IA32 assembly are sort of the most important programming languages for this class. We kind of need you to have a familiarity with C when you walk in the door, or else it's going to be a painful experience for everyone. And by this, I mean you should know what a pointer is, you should know how to work with them, you should know how to do memory management, and you should know the basic syntax of C. Okay? Um, IA32 we will introduce, so you don't have to know it. And it's kind of funny because over the years we've seen a number of, of EE students come in and they're like, well, I'm the opposite. Uh, I'm less familiar with C, but I know IA32 inside and out because I have, you know, I've taken all Glenn George's classes and whatever. So um, that's fine too, but just be aware that it's a pretty steep learning curve for this class and you're going to move fast. We move fast and so um, we try to be as gentle as possible, um, but that kind of just means that we wrap felt around the baseball bat. So just, it's, it's, it's a hard class. Okay, uh, let me see. Yeah, so there's a lot of helpful hints in the textbook. Uh, if you do decide to get it, you'll notice they're in little inset sections, but uh, basically, if you don't get it, then you can go to the TAs for questions or ask me for questions. Basically, I think everything is explained in the assignments at a basic level, but again, the more familiarity you have, the better off you'll be. Okay, and IA32 is what, like, all, you know, I don't think any of you, anyone here doesn't have a laptop that's running an Intel-based processor, so... Um, that's just the, the, the IA32 assembly language is the 32-bit version of the instruction set for that processor. Obviously, if you have a cell phone, IA32 is not going to work on it, but we're not programming cell phones this time. Okay? Let's see. What else do we have to talk about? Yeah, so um, we require that you use a 32-bit uh, environment for the programming, and this is becoming increasingly difficult because everybody's moving to 64-bit because you can only access up to 30, or no, I'm sorry, you can only access up to 4 gigs of RAM with 32 bits, and, well, more than 4 gigs is nice. So, um, basically what we do is we provide a virtual machine image for this class, uh, or you can install your own. Um, part of me feels sad about this, and part of me gets tired of all the complaining about it every year. And it's not like everybody complains, there's just usually a few people who are like, why can't we do this class in 64-bit? Well, it just makes things more complicated. There's a lot of different reasons why we say 32-bit Linux. Like I say here, there's uh, incompatibilities between 32-bit and 64-bit platforms. Uh, if anybody in here ignores this uh, constraint and tries to compile their programs on 64-bit, they will start to notice issues and failures that are really annoying. Uh, there's also variations in how operating systems link and load programs, and that actually is really key. We only talk about that toward the end of the class. If you're really curious about that, take the operating systems class. Uh, and then there's also certain low-level APIs that simply don't exist on Windows or exist on OS X but in a different form. And, you know, we want to be able to get in some, into some really neat programming. So we kind of have to constrain the, uh, the platform that we use in this way. Okay. So one option is to use a CS cluster, which is all still 32-bit as far as I'm aware. And the other option is to install a virtual machine image on your computer using VirtualBox, which is my preferred uh, virtual machine software because it's free and it's reasonably powerful. Oracle now owns it. It was developed by Sun before Sun got acquired by Oracle. And uh, we are working on a VM image and it will be hopefully available pretty quickly. If you run into weird, funky issues because you're trying it on your own system and you're doing 64-bit, we'll tell you, uh, but really, we're not going to support you very much. Okay, because, I mean, really, it's, it's hard enough to get everything working in a 32-bit environment. Okay, we use the GNU tool set, which, again, 
Uh, we're reaching the point where we probably should start thinking about LLVM and Clang and blah, blah, blah. But right now, we're still tied into GNU because that's just what the textbook uses. And it's a powerful set of tools. So we'll go ahead and use all of these things. Uh, GDB especially, I will mention there. Uh, we do have some information for using these tools that you can look at. Obviously, the C track uses GCC. Um, the C++ track uses G++. We have GDB documentation as well. There's also two lectures that I used to give in my spare time, which I have less and less of, about using GDB to debug programs and just how to think about debugging. Very important skill to acquire. And so I will make those lectures available. You can watch them. I would strongly encourage you to have watched them by the end of the second week because in the third assignment, you will have to use GDB anyway. And uh, we always get students. There's like a broad spectrum. There's people who say, I finished each assignment in four hours. Go them. Okay? They walked in with a good knowledge of C anyway and GDB and all of these tools. And then you have people who say, it took me 20 hours to try to get this assignment working. And usually the number one difference between those two categories of students is the four-hour people knew how to use GDB, and the 20-hour people didn't. And so they were stuck trying to put printfs in, and then they see segmentation fault, and they're like, oh, man. And then they go put in more printfs, segmentation fault. So learn to use the debugging tools. They will help you so much. Okay? Just want to make sure I... Uh, put a really strong point on that. Okay, um, so were there any questions about administrative stuff at this point? All right, so that's that. We'll start talking about actual course material. Um, the number one thing that I like to talk about in this first class is why do we need to understand computing systems? I mean, we have Python. I don't have to think about how the hardware works if I just stay in Python all the time. Great, right? Um, I roll my eyes at that one, honestly. Um, but here's the number one reason why we want to understand computing systems. If we know how they work, we can use them more effectively. So the second point is, again, I can't put too fine a point on this. You will be a better programmer if you understand how the computer is doing what it's doing. Here's a couple of simple examples that I have encountered in my own life. So I had a friend who was a... Uh, mechanical engineer. He studied mechanical engineering at Caltech and then he went on to do his PhD and he was doing molecular dynamics simulations where he had a two-dimensional plane and he was simulating the movement of atoms in this two-dimensional plane. And so he had an array like this, atoms, and he had some number of atoms that he was simulating. And then he had uh, two dimensions, so he had, uh, you know, dim-dim, basically. So this is a three-dimensional array, one dimension is the atoms, and then the other two dimensions were for some matrix that he needed for a simulation. And this was the version he sent me, because he said, my program takes me like 15 hours to run, and I don't like that it takes me 15 hours. And so he had this code, for i is zero, i is less than dim, j is zero, j is less than dim, n is zero, n is less than n atoms. So you can see that he's going over the dimensions, and then in the innermost loop, he's going over the atoms, and he's doing some calculation with each one of these values that he has to update. I looked at that, and I said, well, really, you should write it this way. All I did was I switched the order of the loop. So now, the outermost loop is the atoms, and now the inner loops go over these dimensions. And that produced a pretty significant performance improvement. Now, it didn't take 15 hours and turn it into two hours. There were other things we had to do as well. But this shaved a, a significant amount of time off. And so the question is, why? Why does that make it better? So that's one thing that we'll study. Some of you may already have an answer in your head, and that would be really cool, but we're not going to talk about that right now. At the end of the class, everyone should understand that. Here's another one, financial calculations. Now, this is a contrived example, but it's very illustrative. So we have a candy shop in the math department where they like to screw with people. And uh, the candy shop says, you can buy one candy for 10 cents, but the second candy costs 10 cents more. And the third candy costs 10 cents more than that. So each one costs 10 cents more than the previous one, and you only have a dollar to spend. So how many candies can you buy? Four, right? Well, let's say that you didn't know basic arithmetic but you didn't know how to write C programs. So you decided to write this program to solve this mystery 
so that you can figure out how best to spend your dollar. Because you'd like to walk in and say, I'd like four candies, please. So you write this. Funds left is one dollar. The current price, you can see we have a for loop that starts the price at one-tenth of a dollar, so ten cents. And then we say, as long as we have some money left, let's buy another candy. So num candies plus plus. We increment the price by ten cents, and we, you know, we take away the current price from the uh, funds that we have left. What does this program print? We would love it to print at least four and zero, right? That's what we would love to have it print. It actually prints three candies and 40 cents left. What the hell, right? That's it. I quit computer science. I'm going to go become a dancer. <laughs> so, again, very basic behavior to understand once you understand under the hood how things are represented. In fact, you will understand why this fails after the first assignment. But these are all things that it's like you walk into a company to program and you're like, yeah, I'm a programmer. I graduated from Caltech and stuff. And I know things and stuff. And they're like, okay, well, we have this problem. <laughs> okay? Very simple things. So this is what I was just saying. Yeah, so these examples are easy to understand as long as you understand how the computer represents information and how it processes it and so forth. Okay? And we will get much more complicated than this, but these are basic examples. They'll be very easy to understand after the class is over. Now, the second reason why we would like to understand computing system is that, like I was saying at the beginning, these concepts and these fundamental approaches are ubiquitous. And they do have a big impact on the way that hardware is designed, the way that software should be designed and implemented, and so forth. And if you ever decide to take the operating systems class, which if CS24 is hard, CS124 is like, being beaten by CS24 over and over again. So uh, operating system design is also just completely filled with these concepts that we're going to be talking about. So like I say, if you ever participate in hardware design, processor design, system design, or operating system design or implementation, you need to understand what these common challenges are and, and the approaches that people have developed over time to solve them. And like I say, I mean, I don't expect that uh, it's unreasonable that someone in here might invent a new way or a better way to solve some of these problems. In fact, one of the things I love doing, I was just telling a friend about it, the operating system class, in the first week, we talk about how we get to where we are now as far as the way computers work and so forth. Because there's a, there's a history and there's a, a path that we took to get to where we are now. And it's really, you know, sort of illuminating to, to look at that history and understand why we are, you know, why we still use algorithms and techniques that were developed in the 60s and 70s. Why? I mean, it's 2015. So we, we go through some of that stuff in the operating system class. Okay, so here's another one. Uh, just to give you another quick illustration, we have this process abstraction. Anybody with a computer open right now, I can guarantee is doing more than one thing at a time. Okay? But you may only have one processor. That's unlikely nowadays because we're cramming more and more processors into our systems. But we may have multiple programs that have to share a single processor. And I put at the same time in quotes because if you only have one processor, you fake it. You let one program run for a little bit, and then you let another program run for a little bit, and another program run for a little bit. So that's multiplexing processor access, but we're not going to talk about that yet. The real issue is that if my web browser decides to access the website that's got some root kit that it's trying to install on my system, and my OS is good and not fill in your hated operating system here. Um, you know, it, it's, it's able to combat that. You'd like the browser to just crash or shut down. You don't want it to compromise other processes running at the same time. We would like to keep that from happening. So we need to have some kind of isolation mechanism. Also, I have four gigs in my laptop. I actually don't, I have eight in this one. But let's say I only have four gigs in my laptop and I want to run a bunch of programs that together take up more than four gigs of space. How do I do that? We call that virtual memory, where I can actually have more memory in use by my programs than the physical hardware actually has. So the question is, what should the hardware actually provide to make this, both of these mechanisms possible? And again, this is something that people started figuring out in the 50s and the 60s 
so that we could actually do that. Because obviously back then they'd have 16 kilobytes or 32 kilobytes. And that was kind of small. Okay. So these are the kinds of things that we're going to be going through. Now are there any questions about motivations? All right, so let's go ahead and start talking about specific details that we'll care about for this week and going forward. So um, IA32, we have this architecture that uh, is very involved. I think there's like 1,700 or more pages in the, in the manuals that describe IA32. This is an example of an instruction set architecture. And all that means is that it's some set of instructions and a description of the data values that they can operate on that allow us to program a processor that implements that instruction set ar architecture. Okay? So you can have one company develop an instruction set architecture and then another company implement processors that conform to that ISA. That's been happening ever since processors have been created. And you can probably think of two companies right now that implement IA32. You have Intel, obviously, because they developed it, and then you have AMD. There are other ones that have been around in the past, but I think they've been acquired by various companies and so forth. Same thing with ARM. Most of you with cell phones are running a processor that conforms to some version of the ARM ISA. And again, there's multiple companies that implement that ARM uh, ISA. Okay. So yeah, we talked about that. Now there are different ends of the spectrum, because again, you can design instructions in a lot of different ways. IA32 is an example of what we call CISC or complex instruction set computer. And it's really obvious that it is a CISC processor because it has instructions to do things like set up stack frames for nested function invocations, which is a higher level programming language feature that many programming languages don't even offer anymore. It has things like uh, task switching and task management so that you can actually have the processor implement this process abstraction directly in instructions and configuration of the processor. We tend not to use it because it's too constraining. But Intel crams a ton of functionality into this IA32 ISA. So that's an example of something where you have very powerful instructions. There's a huge number of them. Uh, programs get shorter because each instruction is able to do more. But then the logic of supporting it is very, very complicated. And so it's harder to optimize. So that's CISC. The other end of the spectrum is RISC, and that's reduced instruction set computer. And this is where we have a very small number of instructions. They tend to be very simplistic. And so I need more instructions to write my program. But since it, each instruction is really small and simple, the hardware is also small and simple, and I can optimize the crap out of it. I can have concurrent execution pipelines in my RISC processor and so forth. There's a lot of things I can do to actually make my processor super fast. So these are two approaches, and there was a war uh, for a long time between people taking various approaches, and then people started to wake up and realize, actually, there's benefits of both approaches. And so that's why nowadays you'll often see risk-like features on CISC processors and CISC-like features on RISC processors. And these are just a few simple examples. So CISC, you know, uh, a lot of times instructions will actually be implemented in the processor as a microcode that is executed within the processor. So it's like you've got the instruction to set up this nested stack frame thing for higher level languages with nested functions and, and so forth. And that'll be implemented as a little script inside the processor of smaller things to do. And then those things can be optimized. Similarly, risk processors realizing that nobody wants to do like 43 things to do a simple operation will provide larger uh, complexity instructions to allow some of those things to be done more easily. The only place that you really see risk processors, like pure risk processors, is on phones. Or I should really say embedded systems, like ARM is a really good example. Um, does anybody know what ARM actually stands for? Advanced Risk Machines. <laughs> so risk, <laughs> right? Um, but basically when you have an embedded system or a mobile system where you care about being efficient and being low power, risk kind of really wins the day. And so that's where you see a lot of risk uh, capabilities. In fact, there's some real limitations in the way that these processors work. We'll explore some of them in, in uh, future assignments, but we aren't really going to get into that for a while. Now, there was a question or a comment over here. Yeah. Pipelining, that's a very good question. 
So pipelining, I should probably have uh, spent a little bit of time describing that. Pipelining is where um, you have multiple phases that each instruction goes through. So you start, first of all, analyzing what is the instruction. Does it involve arithmetic? Does it involve memory access? Does it involve flow control? I'm jumping or I'm conditional jumping. Then after that is get me the data that it needs. And then there's do the operation. And then there's resolution. Like, do I need to write values back to memory? Do I need to write values back to the status registers and so forth? So there's multiple stages that each instruction goes through when it's executed. And pipelining just means I want to have multiple instructions in flight at any given time. So one can be in the decoding phase. One can be in the get me my data phase. One can be in the do my thing phase, and then the other one could be in sort of the resolution and cleanup phase. So you have multiple instructions in flight being evaluated at the same time. So that's what we mean by pipeline. Okay? Let's see. So how are we going to build a programmable computer? What we're going to do pretty quickly is figure out how we can actually build this mechanism that we call a processor that we can program to do various computations for us. So they are very complicated systems, so we need to figure out a way of, of sort of wrapping our heads around this. So like it says here, what are the basic concepts that underlie programmable computers, and how do we assemble them into a usable system? So what we'll do like today, well actually we're just going to build up some of the basic uh, foundational details today, and then Wednesday and Friday we'll go through how do you build a computer out of this junk. So, um, like I say here, what components make up the computer, what do the instructions look like, and how do we implement a computation? And you'll get to do that for uh, quite a few weeks as we understand how to take programs and translate them down into assembly code. The way that we handle these complicated systems is using an abstraction hierarchy. This is so your friend anytime you have a really complicated system you're trying to implement or understand. Abstractions are very powerful. What you want to do is solve a problem at a certain level, and you want to solve it completely so you don't have to keep thinking about it. So like I say, you're a physical medium of uh, computation. We need some way of computing things built out of physics, physical materials, and so forth. Okay, so like I say, we need a way of representing information. We've been using semiconductors you know, with great success for quite a while now, but a lot of other mediums of communication have been, or communication, I keep saying that, computation have been used. People have even built computers out of Tinker Toys and String. There's a guy, Danny Hillis, who built a big computer that plays tic-tac-toe, and he built it completely out of Tinker Toys and String. And uh, there's other examples. Uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. There's a guy named A.K. Dudney who designed a computer just out of springs and string and pulleys and so forth. I actually have an AND gate in my office that was built entirely out of string and springs and stuff. Some students built it like long before you guys were ever here. So uh, it's pretty neat. It has obvious limitations though. You can't, you can't build a processor out of uh, string just because string stretches and there's other physical issues. But anyway, you design this physical medium for computations and then what you do is you use that medium to build gates. Logic gates that uh, process information in specific ways. And probably many of you are familiar with these terms, AND, OR, NOT, XOR, and so forth. And we implement these gates in the physical medium, and then once we implement the gates, we stop thinking about physics. I don't like physics anyway, that's why I majored in computer science. Okay? I had to take physics, but you, know, you all understand that. Once we have our gates, we start building stuff out of our gates. And we get to a point where we have these functional units, like I described here, counters, arithmetic and logic units, which we'll talk about next time, memory, multiplexers, blah, blah, blah. Those things are built out of our gates, and then we stop thinking about gates. So that's really nice. You can see how each layer of the abstraction hierarchy obscures the layers beneath it, so that I don't have to think about those details anymore. I can think at a higher level of abstraction. Just like when you program in Python, you don't have to think about caches and isolation of processes and so forth. Th those are all abstracted away. So once we have those functional units, we can actually build a programmable computer and we'll go through how to do that next time. And we can program it to implement computations. Yay, that's awesome. But what you will notice is that it is a horribly miserable experience. In fact, like what you'll have to do on the first assignment is implement division 
with a whole series of zeros and ones. It drives this processor that we simulate in memory. And you will be like, okay, I only want to ever do this once, and that is at the most. So uh, what we do on top of that is we continue extending the abstraction hierarchy. We design languages that allow us to write things that are easier for us to understand, and then we translate them. And we have runtime support, like I have here. Stacks, <laughs> it is an abstraction. We'll talk about it uh, in a little bit. So that we can have function calls. So I can actually decompose my operations into units of work that I can reuse. And then we start having things like files. Whoa, files. Processes, threads, and so forth. So we keep building up the abstraction hierarchy till we can do things like access Facebook and uh, share cat photos with people and so forth. Okay? Any questions on this? This is very, very important, this whole notion of abstraction hierarchies. Okay. You'll see it over and over again, I promise you. Now we are studying digital computers, and what this means is that we have zeros and ones everywhere. This is certainly not the only way to represent information. So you could talk about a whole uh, series of topics that just come down to how do we decide to represent information in digital computers, but we won't go into that today. And we have logic gates that allow us to process this information. So we have AND gates. Notice if AND gates produce a 1 when all their inputs are 1. If any of the input is, inputs are 0, then we don't produce a 1. We produce a 0. We have OR gates, which produce a 1 if any of our inputs are 1. These symbols at the bottom are the way that we tend to draw them in logic diagrams when we're drawing schematics. And then we have NOT gates, which basically take one input and then output the opposite. So you say yes, I say no. You say no, I say yes. Okay? That's all a NOT gate is. Now it turns out that you can build just about anything you want from those gates. And in fact, you don't even need OR because you can build OR from AND and NOT. Okay, so notice A or B is just not A anded with not B, and then you invert the result. If you go back and look at the diagram, you can see that OR basically uh, only produces a zero when the inputs are zero. So if I invert the inputs, and them together, and then invert that, then I can end up with the same output as OR using just ands and nots. So here's another example, exclusive OR. I need to be able to detect when there are an odd number of bits on my inputs. So exclusive OR is able to do that. We call it a parity calculation. Um, so you can see if A is 0 and B is 1, then I output 1. If A is 1 and B is 0, then I output 1. Okay. And this is a way that you can implement XOR with just ands and nots. Okay, this is awesome because now I can say A, X, or B instead of saying A and not B or not A and B. I can start not thinking about that stuff. I'm already starting to get more sophisticated. Okay. Now, um, let's see. So we have that. We can actually take these tools and use them to implement basic integer arithmetic. Okay, we'll talk about addition and subtraction. Once you have an addition and subtraction, you can implement multiplication, division, and so forth. So we can just keep building up this hierarchy. Okay? Of course, we need a way of representing our numbers using just our zeros and ones, and we need some circuits that we can use to manipulate these values. So you have a couple problems to solve. One is a data representation problem, where you just sort of come up with a convention for how you want to represent things. Okay? And I should be very clear about this. There's a lot of details in computer science at least in the implementation side, which come down to convention. Why do we use zero and ones? Well, because people in the past decided to do that, and everybody does it, so that's just the way you have to do it now. But there are other ways. Why do we represent numbers the way that we're describing? Well, that's, you know, why, why are there eight bits in a byte? All of these things. It's just kind of a conventional thing at this point. So we'll talk just about simple unsigned integers. You'll have a, a chance to explore decimal values or what we call floating point on the assignment, but unfortunately there's just not time in the class to talk about that. We're used to having integers as vectors of decimal digits. Which one is the most significant digit when you have a base 10 number? It's always the leftmost one, right? And the rightmost one is always the least significant digit. Well, we do the same thing in binary. 
except we only have two digits, zero or one. It makes it a lot easier to do calculations, but then you need a lot of zeros and ones to represent values that don't take very many digits if you have zero to nine. We will also constrain ourselves to a specific number of bits because that makes it a lot easier to design the hardware than if we have a variable number of bits. But it turns out that even when you have a specific number of bits, you can always build libraries and software on top of that that allows you to work with arbitrary numbers of bits. So it's not a big deal, it's not a huge limitation. But we have these various terms that have, again, arisen over time. A nibble is four bits, a byte is eight bits, uh, 16 bits typically is a, a word, actually, that really varies from system to system. We won't get into that right now. But you have 16 bits, 32 bits, and so forth. There are processors that work with 9 bits, 18 bits, 36 bits. It depends on what they're doing. So it just, uh, typically, though, general purpose computers will use things like this. And now we're getting into 64 and 128 bits. So we have to have a way of mapping a sequence of bits into its corresponding number. And this is the way that we do it. You can see that we just, so this b2u is bit vector to unsigned integer. That's what the b2u stands for. And the w is the number of bits we have, and x is the vector of bits that we have. And then what we do is we just go through and say, well, whatever bit x sub i is, take that and multiply it by 2 to the i. And so x sub 0 times 2 to the 0, or 1, that will be whether there's a 0 or a 1 in the value. And then x sub 1 times 2 to the 1 would be whether there's a 2 in the value, and so forth. And we just sum those things up, and that'll give us our number. So we have some examples. This is the way you would represent 42. I'm going to try to fly through this just for the sake of time. So you could expand it out this way. So 0 times 2 to the 0, 1 times 2 to the 1, and so forth. We end up with 32 plus 8 plus 2. 32 plus 8 is 40, and then 2 more is 42. And so that's the base 10 and base 2 representation of 42. Are there any questions about that? Uh, I, I know that not everybody has necessarily seen these kinds of things, but I know a lot of people do see, like, being able to represent numbers in different bases. So I just wanted to make sure if, if there's any questions at this point. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward. It's just imagine that you had a horrible woodworking accident and you only had like, I don't know, uh, forget it. So <laughs> anyway, we won't go there. I was like, oh man, I was just doing woodworking last night. That would be terrible. So um, anyway, so uh, adding integers also turns out to be very easy in base two because we only have zeros and ones. But we do still need to carry because sometimes we'll have a one and a one and the answer for one plus one in base two is 10. So I need to carry a value. So let's say we're adding 106 and 105. There's the base two representations of these. So this is A and B. And we also have a carry now. So 0 plus 1 is 1. That one's really easy. And uh, so we carry the 0. And you can just go through and see how this all works. Now here we have 1 plus 1. And like I said, that's 10. So we write a 0 and carry the 1. And uh, then we have 1 plus 1 is 10. And now we have 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 11. Okay, so you see base 2 goes to 11. And uh, so we just go ahead and, and take care of it that way. Okay, now if you were to take this and look at all the different values, then you could uh, figure out what the answer is here. 211, which is certainly the sum of 106 and 105. Slide where is always correct. Uh, any questions? Pretty easy. So now we just need to design some kind of logic to do this for us. This is the truth table for a, a circuit called a full adder. This is not the way that most processors do it because it's slow. You'll see why momentarily. But we have these inputs, A and B, and carry in. And we have outputs, which are S, the sum, and the carry out. Okay? And you can see how it works. The sum is obviously going to be 1 when there's an odd number of 1 bits, if you were to think about it. Well, if I'm adding 0 and 0 and 1, I should get a 1. If I'm adding 0, 0, 0, I should get 0. And so you, if you look at it, you'll see, oh, odd number of inputs set to 1, sum is going to be 1. Carry out is a 1 when at least two of the inputs are 1. So if two inputs are 1 or three inputs are 1, we get a 1 for the carry out. So what's the logic for this? Well, like I said, um, the sum is going to be relatively easy. We can use our exclusive OR. 
like I said, it, it implements a purity calculation. So that'll tell us if we have an odd number of, of ones. A X or B, X or C in. And carry out is a little bit more complicated because it's going to be set if A and B are both one or if A plus B and C in are one. That's just one way of writing it. Okay. So this is going to be the logic for the carry out. We won't go into too much detail, but if you want to study this later, you'll see that it's correct. So that allows us to add two individual bits together with a carry out. Or I should say a carry in, and then we produce a carry out and a sum. Now if we want to actually generate a W bit result, we can just hook these little guys together into a caterpillar. Or whatever. I mean, they're actually, it's called a ripple adder because you'll notice that they, the, uh, the second adder can't produce its sum until the first adder produces its carry out. The third adder can't produce its sum until the second adder produces its carry out. So you have this unfortunate reality that this is going to take a certain amount of time to compute its results. There's a time complexity involved in this just the way we wired it up. Okay? But hey, it does the trick. Um, it's able to do a, a good job at adding. Now the next thing to think about is, of course, we can't just add anything. We can't just represent anything. For a given W, we have a limit on what values we can represent. So we can represent, like it says here, 0 all the way up to 2 to the W minus 1, just given our representation. So for 8 bits, we can only represent values from 0 to 255. There is no way to represent 256. If I add 1 to 255, I get 0. That's the way the 8-bit computer works. So what happens if I add these together? 175 plus 114, come on brain, go. So it's like 289, right? That's over 255. So I have a problem. And you can see that the binary representation, well now we need 9 bits to represent this result instead of just 8. So if the computer were to add this, and it were a, a stupid 8-bit computer, which they do exist, I shouldn't der, you know, deride them that way. But anyway, it would add these together, and it would get 33. And that is clearly not the right answer. Yes, the rocket ship crashes and everyone dies. So um, ideally, we would like to design our hardware so that it will tell us that this bad thing just happened. We tried to add two numbers, and we got a wrong answer. The worst case, of course, is that it doesn't say anything and our rocket ship crashes and, well, let's say it's an unmanned rocket. It crashes and we lose our investment. Yeah. So, all right? So here's the question. Can this construct actually tell us when there was a problem? Yes. How? Yeah, the uppermost C out value will tell us something. If it's 1... We had a problem. Okay? So we can go ahead and label this thing overflow. And now we have a status value that doesn't just give us information about the result of our computation, but it describes the result of our computation. Like, yeah, here's your answer, and by the way, it sucks. Okay? That's what it tells you. So yeah, that's that's the status value. Okay, now there's many other details that, that go into this. We're going to have to skip some of this. Uh, sign integer representations are also very important. We call this representation two's complement. What we do is we assign the most significant bit to be an offset, basically. So you'll notice that x sub w minus 1 is multiplied by 2 to the w minus 1, and then we just invert that and add that into the result. So it basically takes this range 0 to 255, and it shifts it to be minus 128 to 127. Or 0 to 65,535 to minus 32,768 to plus 32,767. Really simple way of representing it. But that topmost bit, we call it the sign bit, because when the top bit is 0, it's a positive value. When the top bit is 1, it's a negative value. So it's a really easy way of representing things. Okay, so the smallest negative value we can represent is 1 with everything else set to 0. So we, we're applying the offset and not adding anything to it. So minus 128. Largest positive value, we have no offset and all the other bits are set. So we're adding as much as possible. We get plus 127. 
Okay, B two T bit vector to two's complement. Okay, any questions? All right, so we're going to go a little bit late, but we started late. I usually don't sign cards till afterward. Now, um, anytime you want to convert an integer value to its two's complement representation, there's an easy trick, which I learned long ago, probably from Glenn, because he was here when I was an undergrad. Well, what you do is you invert the bits and then add one to it. That's all you have to do to get from an unsigned value into its two's complement re representation. So let's say that we want to take uh, the two's complement representation for minus, minus 42. We take the unsigned representation, which I gave earlier, 0010, 1010. We invert that. This is called one's complement inversion. And uh, that's not very important. And then we add one to it. So we have 1101, and then we just add one to it. So now we end up with 11010110. Okay? And if you were to convert this back using our function, our bit vector to two's complement representation, then we add minus 1 times 2 to the 7 plus 1 times 2 to the 6 and so forth. You take that out, you multiply it all out, and you end up with minus 42. Wow, rocket science. It's really not rocket science. Okay, uh, any questions? All right, let me see. What do we got here? So yeah, the overflow rules do change a lot. I'm not going to talk about this very much. Um, just note that if I have minus 1 and I add 1 to it, I get an overflow. So now we have to change the name of our overflow thing to unsigned overflow because it's only true in unsigned situations. Signed overflow is a very different beast entirely. And there's a whole little section in the textbook that talks about it, but you could probably just Google or Bing, whichever your poison is, uh, signed overflow rules, and you could look up what the details are for that. Okay? I'm not going to talk about it today. But anyway, you can see now we have a way of representing our unsigned and signed integers, at least within a range. And we have a way of adding them together. And so what we're going to start doing next time is talking about how we can create components that we can now assemble into a processor that's able to process these values in more sophisticated ways. That's what we're going to do next time. So last points, make sure you do these things if you haven't already. Enroll in the CS24 Moodle. Get your CS account set up if you intend to use the Annenberg Lab. And obviously, you don't have to, but if you want, you can get a copy of the textbook. So we'll see you all on Wednesday.